Just a real quote, uh, just a little quote here from the history of the Ogden Surgical Medical Society uh, uh, pamphlet that's out there. If you want to look at the table, it says, John Shaw Billings said, the education of the doctor which goes on after he has his degree is, after all, the most important part of his education. And so just remember that as you, as you go out there. And, and the other thing that's sort of exciting is, you know, over the years, the Ogden Surgical Medical Society has had some of the giants in medicine come and speak to us. And, and so one day it may be neat to say in, in 10 or 20 years we had some of these giants of medicine come and speak to us in the early years, and you may be some of those. And so we're excited to, that you were able to speak to us today. But it also is interesting to note that one of the, in fact, the first speaker that they ever had for the Ogden Surgical Medical Society was a man by the name of Dr. Charles B. Huggins uh, from the University of Chicago Medical Center. And he was, uh, ended up being a great speaker and uh, ended up being that 20 years later, he was a Nobel uh, Prize winner in medicine. And so today, we'd like to welcome another uh, Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Mario Capecci. And just a little bit about his uh, background. He was born in Italy. And uh, he uh, received his B.S. in chemistry and physics from Antioch College in 1961 and his Ph.D. in biophysics from Harvard University in 1967. He then completed his thesis work under the guidance of Dr. James D. Watson. As you know, he was one of the co-founders of the structure of DNA, and so he has a great background. He then went on... Um, and uh, was an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School in, from 1969 to 71, then became an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. Uh, later, we are fortunate that he became a professor uh, of biology at the University of Utah. Uh, um, in 82, he was the adjunct professor of Onco oncological services, or sciences, division of molecular biology and genetics the University of Utah, at the University of Utah School of Medicine. He also, in 1988, uh, uh, until the present time, was an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, in 1989 professor of human genetics at the University of Utah and Medical Center, and uh, in 2002 the co-chairman of the Department of Human Genetics in University of Utah School of Medicine. He is best known for his technology of gene targeting in mouse embryo-derived stem cells. Uh, that allows the scientists to create uh, mice with mutations in any desired gene um, by choosing which gene to mutate and how to mutate it. Uh, then that allows the investigator to have complete uh, freedom in manipulating the, gene, uh, the DNA sequences in the genome of living mice and allows detailed evaluation of, of the gene's function during its development or post-development phase. So we are very lucky to have Dr. Kopecki here, and with that, I'd like to uh, give him a warm welcome. So it's a great pleasure to be a guest uh, of the Ogden Surgical and Medical Society and to be able to share our, our work with you. So that's good. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do today is uh, I'll present to you some of our work. We work on a variety of topics ranging from uh, cancer to actually uh, neuropsychiatric disorders. But Today I'll concentrate on cancer. And the first thing that I want to point out is simply what do we think about? Uh, what are our goals when we start uh, the analysis uh, in terms of modeling cancer in the mouse? The first point is do we know the inducing event? In many cancers, you end up with a tumor. You know that many things have happened, but you do not know the order of events. And often you don't know the beginning uh, event. <clears throat> and so it's advantageous to work with a cancer that you do know what the inducing event is. The time of induction is important. That is, you're not born with cancers. It's a somatic disease, uh, and you're acquired. And so if you want to model that cancer, it should also be a somatic model. It shouldn't, you shouldn't put it into the germline, but you should activate it at a later stage. The stoichiometry is important. That is, if you have an oncogenic event occur, normally you don't have thousands of copies of that oncogenic event. You start out with one event, and in some cancers you do ha get an amplification of that event. But normally it's one or two events as opposed to hundreds or thousands of events. 
But the most important thing is the cancer is specific. You have a particular type of cancer, breast cancer. Uh, you have <clears throat> uh, skin cancers, liver cancers, and so on. It's specific to a particular uh, tissue, and the interaction of the cancer cells with that tissue is an important component of the etiology of that cancer. And so again, we want to model it in, the, in that context. Now, <clears throat> the cancers I'm going to be talking about are sarcomas. And you might ask why sarcomas and not carcinomas. Uh, sarcomas are rare, but they afflict a very important uh, population. Uh, they affect a critical population, that is mostly children, young adults, uh, and adolescents. Uh, they're extremely aggressive as a whole. Uh, for example, I'll be talking about alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, uh, and the prognosis currently is for those children, after first presentation, 80% are likely to die within five years, and that prognosis hasn't changed in the last three decades which means we do not understand the cancer and current measurements of surgery, uh, radiation, and chemotherapy are not working. So what one has to do is understand the cancer and then develop a, uh, a treatment, a therapy, based on that knowledge. <clears throat> now, uh, finally, I should, I should uh, the second point, third point, whoops, sorry, is that they're not extensively studied, and that's because they are rare. And so and it's harder to get a large group together in order to do effective studies on that subgroup. So, and then finally, uh, the fourth is that we do know the initiating events, sorry, uh, of most of these cancers. Uh, they are a chromosomal uh, translocation, a reciprocal chromosomal translocation, and each one is associated with a different subtype. So there are now over 25 different sarcomas that have been identified with specific uh, chromosomal translocations, as well as 25 independent leukemias and lymphomias. So it's a, a broad range of cancers. And the final point I want to point out is that carcin uh, sarcomas do not appear to be as complex as carcinomas. A hallmark of carcinomas is genome instability. And so all of a sudden in the cell, thousands of events are occurring, and it's difficult to sort out the ones that are contributing to the cancers from the ones that are simply arising because now the genome is completely unstable. In uh, most sarcomas, uh, the, uh, the genotype, the uh, karyotype is stable, and there's often just the reciprocal translocation is present, and so it presents a much easier uh, assortment of events to sort through to find out which ones are causative and which ones are spurious. Okay. So I'll start out with alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. So from the name, you know that this is a muscle cancer. Uh, but what wasn't known when we started the study is which cells uh, of the muscle lineage are responsible for the cancer. Now, <clears throat> this is a translocation. Uh, and they're actually, when you have a translocation, you actually have four things happening. You have two new products. So you have two chromosomes are broken, and then they rearrange, but they don't come back together with the same partner, they switch in chromosomes. So everything is fine except at the junction, and at that junction you create now two new products. Uh, so in this case, one is called port. These are both transcription factors. It's PAX3 4CAD is one product, and then the other, on the other chromosome, there will be 4CAD PAX3. Now, which ones is causative uh, is often not clear. Uh, in the case of alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, we believe that one is more important than the other. The arguments aren't completely airtight, but the argument, and I'll go through them in a little bit, uh, but I'll, I'll come back to the uh, other possibilities. The, uh, and at the same time, because we're making a translocation, uh, and the joint, the joint products are being now half of a gene of one and half of the gene the other, you lose one allele of PAX3, and you lose also one allele of 4 cad These are both transcription factors. So if I look around this audience, uh, I don't see anybody that is a PAX3 heterozygote. That is, that you've lost one copy of the PAX3 gene. Uh, the reason I would know that is that PAX3 is important for making melanocytes, uh, and what you often would have is, for example, a shock of white hair. Uh, 
And what is known is that uh, patients uh, that are heterozygous for Pax3 mutation do not have a higher incidence of this cancer. So we don't think the loss of a Pax3 allele, uh, one allele, is, uh, uh, contributes to the cancer. On the other hand, a loss of a forkhead allele may be important because I'll show you that it looks like a tumor suppressor. And re remember that if you have uh, one mutation, then you can lose the other, and then you have uh, both defective copies, and then that could be contributing to cancer. And I'll come back to that point if I remember. So, so here is the actual uh, product that we think is causative, and that is Pax3 forkhead. So what we can see is here is the Pax3 gene, the contribution from Pax3, and this is the contribution from Forkhead. It has the DNA binding domains for the Pax3, uh, and uh, both DNA binding domains. And then the other it has is a transactivation domain coming from Forkhead. Uh, so this particular product has both, whereas the reciprocal product has neither. It has neither a DNA binding domain nor a transactivation domain, and therefore we think it's not important. On, uh, and further, if you actually look at the tumors, what you find is the great majority will, will be expressing this fusion gene, but only a small minority will be expressing the other uh, express, uh, gene product. So that says that this is likely to be the product of importance. But I should point out that it doesn't tell you anything about earlier history. That is, the other product could have been in, required early in the cancer history and then uh, not needed later, and therefore that's why we don't see the expression of that product late. So one of the things one can ask is, well, if we're going to model this type of cancer, why not create, create the translocation itself? And we can create any chromosomal translocation that we want, and we've generated many, many different uh, translocations uh, in cells. The problem is that the frequency is about one in a million. Okay, so when you're modeling a cancer, uh, what you want is every mouse to get the cancer so that then you can study it. So if you only have one in a million cells in a particular tissue have this a translocation, then the pool may not be large enough for then subsequent events that are also required for cancer to come up at a reasonable frequency so that every mouse gets a tumor and we may have to look at a hundred or a thousand different mice and that gets very expensive just to look at that particular tumor. So for that reason we did not go via this uh, possibility even though it's technically feasible. Uh, instead, what we did was to what we call a knock-in uh, approach, where what we're doing is recreating uh, the translocation product uh, at a push of a button. That is, when we add uh, a particular uh, enzyme present, for example, and we can make that even dependent on adding a small molecule at the same time. And that takes advantage of uh, a site-specific recombination system, which is present in bacteria, in particular bacterial viruses, and it's called Cree-LOX-P. So LOX-P is just a small sequence of uh, bases. It's 34 base pairs, and if we have two LOX-P sites, one here and one here, and then orient them in the same direction, in the presence of the enzyme Cree, it will mediate a recombination between these two events and in the process excise whatever's in between. So in the present, by controlling where Cre is present and when it's functional, we can control when deletion of a particular part of DNA occurs. So that allows us then to build the model. And that's shown here. So here, uh, uh, we first, here is the entire Pax3 locus. So we're going to target everything to the Pax3 locus. And here we put in LOXP sites. And then here we put a strong stop signal. So everything beyond this, lo uh, this locus isn't seen in the absence of Cree. Okay, so now we add Cree, excise that DNA, and form the translocation product. Uh, so then by controlling where Cree is, because we brought all of that DNA to the Pax3 locus, then we can generate the fusion gene any time that we want, and in any cell type that we want. Okay. So here's the actual construct. So here's, over here would we start with Pax3 locus, the first seven exons, LOXP, LOXPs. These are the last three exons which we're going to be removing. Here's a strong stop signal, and here is uh, sequences from 4 including the last two exons, which are part of the fusion gene. 
And then here we have uh, sequences that allow us to construct this. And what I can show you is that doing all of this engineering in the absence of Creed, the mouse is perfectly happy. We have not affected PAX3 function. And we would know that because if had we reduced PAX3 activity, what we would see is white splotches on this mouse. And even in the homozygous state, we do not see any splotches, and therefore we're not affecting uh, PAX3 function in the absence of Creed. So now let me tell you a little bit about these two uh, transcription factors, PAX3 and uh, 4K. So this shows you where PAX3 is functioning. What we've done is simply insert a, a gene from E. coli that in the presence of a substrate turns those cells uh, blue. And so what we can see, for example, is PAX3, oops, sorry, uh, is functioning in the midbrain, uh, it's functioning along the neural tube, in the somites, and here's the limb, and if you could see, you would actually see a muscle progenitor cells starting to migrate into the limb uh, and starting to form muscle. So this is uh, at a stage about 10, 10 uh, E11, and gestation period of a mouse is 20, uh, 21 days or so. Okay, so that tells us where PAX3 is functioning. Here is 4KED, and I've drawn it in a constellation that looks very similar to another gene you may be familiar with, and that's P53. And that's why uh, people think this is a tumor suppressor gene, uh, and it's also sensitive, essentially, to oxidative stress or DNA damage, and the op output is either to arrest that cell or to lead it to apoptosis if it can't uh, 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 correct the damage and also it's dependent on P10 and so on. So it looks very, very much like a tumor suppressor gene and therefore may be playing a part in this cancer. Okay. Now also I'm gonna to have to remind you, uh, I don't know how much reminding uh, about that you make muscle in two waves. There's an embryonic stage, which is illustrated here, uh, where the muscle is generated from somites. Uh, <clears throat> And then here are all the steps going essentially from the myogenic progenitors and the genes that are involved in those steps to myoblast, to myotube, to finally uh, differentiate myofibers. And all the genes that are involved, and what's outlined in red are the genetic markers that are found in alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. So that's, this indeed tells us that it must be a muscle tumor, but it doesn't tell us at what stage uh, of, the, uh, of the system is actually responsible for making the cancer cell because genes of every stage are found to be expressed in the tumor. Now, I'll point out a couple of things. I've already talked about PAX3 and PAX7. CMET is interesting. Uh, CMET turns out to be a target of PAX3, a direct target, and it's important for migration. And that is, uh, if you have a C make a mouse that's CMET negative, what you, the progenitor cells are made, but for example, the ones that are supposed to go into the limb, stop and do not migrate into the limb. And that turns out to be an important player in this cancer because it gives essentially this cancer uh, an ability to migrate. Those cells are just set up already for migration and metastasis. The other marker that I'll t come back to is MIF6, which is a marker that's expressed only in fully differentiated muscle. And so I'll take advantage of that later. Okay. So then uh, after having essentially patterned all of your muscle, the bulk of your muscle takes place in the second wave. And that takes place, uh, involves, for example, using satellite cells. Uh, and this is, uh, in humans, it starts at about three weeks of age. In mice, it starts out uh, one day before birth. Uh, and this is, I sh I'll again point out that this is important for making the bulk of the muscle, but it's also important for regeneration of muscle. For example, if you exercise too much, destroy your muscle, then satellite cells are utilized then to regenerate that muscle. Okay. So again, the model, so we have here a knock-in model where we have the PAX3 locus, blocks P sites, bring into that same locus sequences from forkhead, set it up so that in the presence of Cree, then we excise that DNA and form the fusion gene. So by controlling where Cree is made, we control where the fusion gene is produced. Okay. So what happens at zero time? What happens if we actually activate the system in the first cell of the embryo? And remember that 
Uh, in that model, let's go back, uh, we also have uh, fluorescent protein, EGFP, that's isolated essentially from a, um, a organism that has this fluorescent protein in it. We can take that gene, introduce it at this locus, so whenever we form the fusion gene, we turn on that uh, EGFP, and therefore those cells will fluoresce yellow or green. So this is, allows us then to simply look at the embryo and see where have we formed the fusion gene when we uh, actually activate it at the first cell after uh, the sperm and egg come together. And what we can see, for example, is that early in embryogenesis is expressed in the somites, in the branchial arches. This is simply the embryo looking at it from the side. And then if we look at sections across the embryo, uh, here is the dorsal neural tube, and again, uh, the fusion gene is produced in the uh, dorsal aspect of the neural tube, in the uh, dermal myotome, and then in the progenitor cells marching into the, uh, in two ways into the limb. So this pattern is identical to PAX3. So that tells us that space is being controlled by the uh, regulatory sequences that are associated with PAX3. What Forkett is bringing into the equation is quantitation. That is, the amount of fusion gene that we produced is actually much greater than the amount of PAX3 protein. So that's the uh, other end of the gene. Uh, and its regulatory sequences are making, amplifying how much protein is being made. Now, if we look at these mice and, uh, and ask what happens to these mice, uh, what we show here is the control and where we've engineered the mouse so it has the fusion gene all set up in the absence of Cree and then the other allele will be wild type and this, so this is a normal embryo. If on the other hand now we bring in Cree at that time uh, then this is the embryo and this embryo is in deep trouble. One thing when for example you see an enormous outgrowth of the midbrain and the reason for that is that the uh, the stem cells, the neural stem cells, just continue to proliferate in the membrane. Remember that PAX3, as well as the fusion gene, is being made in the midbrain, and those cells just continue to grow and grow and then lead to this enormous outgrowth of the midbrain. The other aspects of this phenotype is very similar to what's called a splotch mutant. It's a PAX3 homozygous, loss of function of both PAX3 genes. Okay, remember that we only have, the other PAX3 allele is perfectly normal. So that tells us essentially that this fusion gene is specifically turning off uh, PAX3. And indeed, we've shown that. And what happens is that PAX3 can autoregulate itself. That is, its protein is used to make more of itself by controlling how much transcription is being made and therefore amplifying the amount of protein that's being made. And what we find is that this fusion gene now sits on that same element and turns off the PAX3 function. And as a consequence, this embryo has many of the uh, defects that are present in a splotch mutant that is a PAX3 homozygous mutant. So that tells us something about what this fusion gene is doing, but this embryo dies in utero, sorry, uh, and therefore does not produce cancer. Okay, so what do we do next? Okay, if we asked any oncologist what's the most likely source of, of, of this cancer, and they would tell me satellite cells, because those cells are capable of growth, they're capable of being turned on, and so they have the machinery essentially to then become a cancer cell. So that what the first thing we did was simply make the fusion gene in every satellite cell of that mouse and ask, do they develop tumors? Okay. So here we can do that because PAX7 is expressed in satellite cells. And so what we can do is make Cree uh, every time that PAX7 gene is produced, and that's shown here. Uh, so here's the PAX7 gene, what we have an iris, which allows essentially ribosomes to enter in and look at this message beyond this point, and then we, in there we put Cree, and therefore any time PAX3 is functioning, we also make Cree, and therefore all satellite cells will have then Cree, and therefore then if we cross this mouse to the other mouse, then we produce a fusion gene in every satellite cell. Okay, and what happens to those mice? And that's shown here. So at birth, things look pretty normal. Okay, if you looked after you carefully, what you would see is that this is the control, this is a sibling, doesn't have the, uh, the, uh, the uh, PAX3 gene, and this is a uh, the mutant that does have the PAX3, the uh, 
uh, I'm say the uh, Cree gene, uh, and therefore what you see is the nose is a little narrower, and that's because Pac-7 is important in making essentially the cartilages in the nose. But uh, by three weeks of age, it's easy to see which one has the, uh, the fusion gene, and that's shown here. So this is a sibling that doesn't have the fusion gene. This one has it. It's about one-third of the size. And the reason is that that second wave of making muscle is now greatly reduced. We haven't eliminated uh, satellite cells, but there's about only one-third the no normal number, and therefore muscle uh, is not, uh, the bulk of the muscle isn't being made in that second phase, and therefore these mice are much smaller. But and here simply shows you that the satellite cells are there, they look normal, they're simply reduced in number. Uh, but despite every satellite cell having the fusion gene, these mice do not develop alveolar rhabdomyer sarcoma. So that tells us that isn't the source of the tumor. So now we move on, what do we do next? And what we've decided to do is to make it in fully differentiated muscle. And, and that's where MIF6 comes in. So remember that MIF6 is important for, uh, is a gene that's only expressed in the differentiated muscle. So now what we want to do is not only make it in uh, differentiated muscle, but we want to control time. So we want to be able to add a small drug, which then is required also to make uh, the CRE in these cells, uh, and we can control that by then injecting the small drug after birth. So that's shown here. So here is Cre, and we use uh, a system called doxycycline, and, uh, and which is dependent essentially on the uh, activation essentially of the system, which requires a protein, which is called RTTA, and then in the presence of doxycycline, those two activate transcription of uh, Cre, and it only occurs in differentiated muscle. And again, we can show that by looking at a marker, indeed, it is only in differentiated muscle. Then when we do this, uh, then we look at the biggest muscle in your body, which is your quadricep muscle, and what we can see is that half of those fibers are green, fluorescently green, the other is background, uh, and that is actually fortunate. Had it been 100% and then we got tumors, we wouldn't know whether it was causative or not. But if it only occurs in half the fibers, then we can look at every fiber and ask, do they arise because they've had the a fusion gene produced in those fibers? And what we can see is indeed now these mice do produce alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. We can give the uh, tumor material to a histologist that specializes. This was Cheryl Coffin. She specializes in alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. She couldn't distinguish the mouse tumor from the human tumor material. We've looked at over 20 different markers. Uh, all of them are specific for alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. But unfortunately, only one in 200 mice developed the tumor. We actually expected that because, remember, there's multiple events besides the initiating event to have to occur in those cells in order to give rise to the tumor. However, what you can do is simply to go now back to the tumor material and ask what other events are occurring in these tumors. And what happens uh, is, for example, P53, mutations in P53 and inc 4 arf are present in over 50% of the tumors that are looked at. And what, if we introduce conditional mutations in those, which are again activated by the same Cree driver in the same cells, then every mouse gets a tumor, and they specifically get alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. Now, what's interesting is that what we had to do is to activate the fusion gene in fully differentiated muscle. So what that says is that, and we can actually see that process here, so this is what's called a rhabdomyoblast. It's essentially, it started out as a muscle fiber, and then it's still at this, remember that in a muscle fiber you have multinuclear, many, many nuclei all fused into a single fiber. And then what happens is that this thing collapses into a bag, uh, and then what the bag does is to break down into single cells, and then those cells now have to acquire other events then pro that progress it into, uh, uh, into the tumor. And so we can see all of this process occurring, and so what we now know is the cell of origin is actually fully differentiated muscle as opposed to a stem cell type muscle earlier in the game. And similarly, if we add 
uh, uh, INC4 ARF, again, every uh, tumor gets this muscle. So what we're saying is that those genes that fail to checkpoint in the presence of these events happening uh, then go on to progress to the tumor material itself. So now I want to go into a different cancer model, and in this case it's uh, synovial sarcoma. Now this was more of a challenge because in this case, at least in the last case, we knew that it was muscle uh, that was the uh, culprit, but we simply didn't know which stage of muscle development was the culprit. In this case, uh, people had no idea what the cell of origin is of synovial sarcoma. Uh, what's known about synovial sarcoma, and here we're showing you a common tumor, is that it occurs near joints. Uh, and that's where the name came from because people speculated possibly the synovial tissue may be a, a source of this tumor, and that turns out not to be the case. But they, these tumors do arise near joints. Now, in the case of synovial sarcoma, the histology is more complex. There are actually three uh, types, subtypes. There's monophasic, which are mostly spindle cells. There's poorly differentiated, which are simply small cells with large nuclei. And then there's biphasics, where they have both essentially mesenchymal cells as well as epithelial type cells. And so, and what you can see is the organization essentially of the tissue starting to make, making tissues, uh, organelle, organelles within the tissue. Now, <clears throat> Uh, just because uh, I'm talking to uh, medical uh, uh, professors, professionals, uh, I'll present you with a case study uh, that we've just recently looked at uh, in our own lab. This is a pediatric oncologist. I should point out in the last slide, I said we. It's always the royal we. Uh, in that case, it was a pediatric oncologist that was uh, specifically interested in alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, uh, and this one is particularly interested mostly in bone tumors as well as synovial sarcoma. So this is Leslie, is a, and she's 20 years old. Uh, she is uh, uh, an outstanding student. Uh, she uh, studies in genetics. She's a student at uh, at the U, and uh, was uh, this was made a, a few weeks ago. This slide uh, she has now graduated. Now, in about, uh, over about a year ago, she uh, essentially complained of having mild aches in her uh, thigh, uh, and the uh, doctor suggested that she stretch and exercise, and then a year later they did an MRI because the pain didn't go away, and what they found was an enormous tumor right here. <clears throat> uh, and here, if we look at it in cross-section, uh, again, here's the tumors. And at this point, it's a very a, a large, aggressive tumor. And by looking at the histology of this tumor, uh, it was clear that it was synovial sarcoma. Uh, and then she did have the, uh, the uh, hallmark of synovial sarcoma, which I'll come to in just a minute. And then if we blow this up, we can see that it is a typical, essentially, monophasic spindle type cell uh, sarcoma at this point. <laughs> okay. And this has a translocation. In this case, it's between the X chromosome uh, and the chromosome 18. And the product of the translocation is shown here. So this, uh, on the a chromosome 18, is called SYT. Uh, on the X chromosome, it's called SSX. Now, SYT turns out to be a, uh, a, chroma, a chromatin remodeler, and it's an activator protein, a co-activator protein. And SSX, is, which is on the chromo X chromosome, is a co-repressor uh, of chromatin remodeling. So, in the fusion gene itself, what you have is almost the entire intact SYT gene and then about half, which includes the, the uh, repressive domain of SSX. Okay. So in this case, in, SSX, in the X chromosome, there are actually six uh, SSX genes, and one and two are involved in the tumor. There's one case reported of SSX4 present in synovial, and the others are not seen in the tumor materials. Now, the modeling we did here was slightly different from the last gene. Uh, and the reason for that, that it was clear that space was going to be c controlled by SYT. And SYT is ubiquitous expressed. It's expressed in all cells. And so we didn't have to worry about space. 
So what we could do is actually take a cDNA, which is isolated from the human tumor material, uh, and in this case in, involved SYTSSX2, and then introduce it into a ubiquitously expressed a locus of the mouse, which is called Rosa uh, 26. Now, in that locus, what we also do is to, here's the promoter for the Rosa lo, uh, loci, and then in, the, in between SYTSSX, the fusion gene cDNA, we place LOXP site and a stop site. So normally, in the absence of Cree, this gene isn't transcribed, and therefore you don't make the fusion protein. However, in the presence of Cree, we remove this stop sign, and therefore now activate it wherever Cree is present, we make the fusion gene. So this was a slightly different modeling, simply because we didn't have to worry about space. Okay, so <clears throat> what happens if we introduce the Cree at, again, at very early, at the one cell stage? And what happens is you get uh, a blob, and it's green, it's fluorescent green, because now when we, uh, as soon as we activate Cree, we also turn off GFP, the green fluorescence protein, and that's shown down here. Whoops, sorry right here, but what we, if we look at that, what we find is a completely disorganized embryo, and it's very quickly reabsorbed, and therefore it doesn't produce a tumor. Okay, so then we said, aha, uh, one of the things that's present in near uh, joints is also muscle, so because you want essentially to be able to move that uh, joint, and therefore we said, well, maybe we should look at the muscle lineage itself in this particular cancer, uh, and uh, since we, the last time we looked at the alveolar, we looked at fully differentiated, we skipped all the way down to here and looked at MIF6 cream. Okay? And uh, if we do that, uh, what we get is a myopathy. We don't get any tumors. And this was a surprise, but perhaps shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, I should point out that the frequency of generating translocations is about one in a thousand. Okay, remember that in your lifetime you have about 10 to the 17 cells, which means you have 10 to the 14th different translocation present in your body. Okay, some of these are likely to cause other types of diseases. And in fact, recently a myopathy has now been associated with the translocation after this uh, publication. So I think what we will see is other diseases uh, besides cancer will actually uh, have involvement of translocation products chromosomal translocation products. So this simply shows you the, that it is a typical myopathy. So here we're looking at the normal tissue. Here's the uh, tissue, the muscle tissue in which we've activated uh, this fusion gene. And it's, uh, and for example, here, what you can see is all the nuclei lined up in the fibers. And what this is telling us is that there is uh, cell death and then regeneration of that muscle, cell death and regeneration, and a uh, output of that is typically found of these nuclei all lined up in the muscle fiber, and they have wavy fibers, and these mice eventually die about six months simply of weakness, uh, and then, uh, but do not develop tumors. So then we have to look now at other possibilities. Okay, now, <clears throat> Uh, the first thing we did is simply look at progenitor cells, PAX3 and PAX7 Cree, and that also led to uh, embryonic lethality and no tumors. So then we looked at the next step, and that is the uh, myoblasts, uh, and here we could have looked at either MyoD or MIF5. We chose to make MIF5 Cree, and we used that, uh, and then what we get is uh, alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. I'm sorry, uh, synovial sarcoma and it's always near joints, okay? So, and again, and under, but uh, unlike the last case, now the penetrance is 100%. So every mouse that has this uh, a gene activated now, uh, this fusion gene activated in myoblast then develops tumors and often multiple tumors. Uh, and the, uh, the tumors are green, as anticipated. They have, they metastasize, the pattern of metastasis is identical to human uh, 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 scenario. Uh, for example, lymph nodes is one of the very first cases, of, uh, first uh, points that we find it. And here is a case where we actually have it in the cerebellum, uh, which is less, uh, is rare, but we know it's metastasis because uh, this uh, product is never found, essentially, uh, in, in the, normal product is never found in cerebellum tissue. 
Uh, it histologically looks identical to synovial sarcoma. We may mainly get uh, monophasics, and I should point out that in humans, if it's SSX2, you get mostly monophasics. If it's SSX1, you get mostly biphasic. And what we found was it's about a 17 to 1 ratio, monophasic to biphasic. But if we looked at little tumors, what we found them is then they were monophasic. If we looked at the larger tumors, they were biphasics. So that suggested that maybe it's actually the tumors aren't different between SSX1 and SSX2. It's simply the progression is more rapid in SSX1, and therefore at first presentation is already biphasic, whereas in SSX2 it's slower, and therefore pre first presentation will be monophasic. And well now we're doing retrospective analysis in humans to see whether that uh, correlation holds. Okay, it has all the markers of synovial sarcoma. Uh, for example, here we're showing you a biphasic tumor, which has both mesenchymal markers and also uh, cyt the uh, cytokeratins, which are present, for example, in the epidermal markers. It's uh, common, if BCL2 is commonly seen, and again, in the mouse, it's found that. And in fact, we can look at now thousands of genes, and, and when you look at a human tumor, now we can see a profile, a signature, which involves hundreds of different genes specific to that tumor, and what we find is, similarly in the mouse tumor, we have the exact same signature. So it is a good model. Uh, now, what puzzled us was that the tumor is green, but the surrounding tissue, this is just autofluorescence, isn't green. Okay, remember that we're labeling myoblasts, therefore the whole t muscle should also be green, and it isn't. And the question is, why was that? And here what we're showing you is, if we look early in, uh, in the embryo, after activating the, uh, uh, the fusion gene in myoblasts, what we see is, here's a uh, developing muscle, and here are the cells that are going to participate in making that muscle. What you can see is the green color is not in the fiber itself, but it's those myoblasts are there, but they're not participating in making muscle. And if we look just a little later, what we find is that the cells are dying. And they're dying by apoptosis and at an enormous rate. Uh, and so, therefore, not participating in making muscle, except uh, in near cartilage, okay? So here's actually a rib, and all the cells along that rib aren't dying. So what that tells us is that the cartilage itself is producing a factor which is preventing those cells from dying, and therefore then they can continue on to progress and form the tumor. And we're now trying to identify that uh, factor. Okay, so the other thing that was puzzling is that these mice develop tumors, but they're running around, okay? Remember, they were killing myoblasts. Now, uh, in, uh, for formation of myoblasts, there are actually two genes, MyoD and MIF5. And if you m make a knockout mouse of MIF5, those mice are okay. If you make a knockout mice of MyoD, those mice are okay. If you knock out both, then they can't make any muscle. So that said that those two genes are redundant. But the redundancy can be two, of two types. They can be essentially both genes are present in the cell and their overlapping functions. Alternatively, they can be independent cell lineages, one that only expresses one and the other expresses the other. And we could test that simply by making diphtheria toxin, which kills cells, and then activating it with MIF5 Cre, and then asking, do these mice make muscle or not? And the answer is that they're perfectly capable of making muscle. Uh, and I'll just look at this panel right here. We're using an independent marker for GFP, and what you can see here is in the absence of diphtheric toxin, here is in the presence of diphtheric toxin, we've killed all of those cells, but the muscle's still there. Okay, so that tells us that they're independent lineages. And what happens is that early uh, both lineages are present, then as the uh, MIF5 is dying, then the MyoD lineage uh, compensates and starts to uh, grow rapid, more rapidly and muscle development occurs normally. So that tells us something about the biology of the system during this, uh, these experiments. And this simply shows you at the protein level that initially, uh, if we look at early, we can see essentially the MIF5 present, but in presence of DT then uh, DTA, the diphtheria toxin, then all of those cells are killed, and we don't have any uh, MIF5 protein being made. There are cells that have those uh, cells in them. <coughs> okay, so here I, I pointed out that the outcome is the, in humans, 
is dependent on whether you have SSX2 or SSX1, that this is much more rapid uh, and and this is, and also you get mostly biphasics, and this is monophasics, and it takes longer to die. Oops, now it's, uh, I've run out of battery. Oh, no, yeah. Oh, here we go, okay. Well, sort of. Okay, so anyway, um, so what we've shown is that the progression is probably responsible for this, that is, as SX2 tumors simply develop slower, and therefore you catch them early at the monophasic phase, whereas SSX1 develop phase more rapidly, so when you first look at it, it's already biphasic. And so here is simply a summary of those results, and what we've shown in this case is that the myoblasts are the progenitors for the cancer, and in particular, in this case, we used MyoD, uh, My, MIF5. We could have done it the same experiments with MyoD uh, in a, the other lineage that was present. So one part of that, that this isn't a good model in terms of cancer is that most cancers are sporadic. So when we're turning on the fusion gene in myoblasts, we're turning it on in all MIF5 expressing myoblasts, okay? Whereas normally what you would have is the, uh, the chromosomal translocation would occur in one cell and then that cell would slowly uh, build up as it divides, but the surrounding cells would be normal. So we wanted to do the same thing uh, more sporadically than, uh, than was simply shown here. And we could do that by using, again, this Cree-ER, where ER allows us to control. It's a, uh, it's a Cree that's dependent on tamoxifen, so it's dependent on when we add the tamoxifen that we actually turn on the Cree itself in a functional form. So that allows us to introduce a sporadic nature to it and then ask, do we again get uh, tumors? If we now simply turn it on randomly throughout the mouse, uh, the fusion gene in any old tissue, and then ask, uh, does the tumor progress? And is it synovial sarcoma? And the answer is we do get tumors, and we get tumors again in every mouse. It's hundreds of percent penetrant. Histologically, it's the same. And then if we look at, at the marker level, it's the same. And then finally, if we look at, at the genome level, where we're looking at thousands of genes, again, it uh, has a hallmark, essentially a signature of synovial sarcoma. So then again, by just turning it on randomly, then those cells uh, will uh, become a cancer cell. Unfortunately, in this case, we do not know the source of the tumor because we, we have no idea. We're not controlling where. All we know is that what the outcome finally is is synovial sarcoma. And now what we're doing is trying to create it in such a way that we can also identify which cell type it is. So I think with that, I'll finish and uh, uh, turn it over to questions. And thank you for your patience. I hope it wasn't too much cancer. And I'd be happy to try to answer any questions that uh, uh, come up. Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, no, I think if it's, uh, uh, no, I, I think the, uh, which kind of sarcoma was it? It's, yeah, no, then uh, uh, over, an, over 90, you know, over 98% of, uh, of alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma is a translocation based. I mean, the translocation can occur any time. It can occur during development or post-development. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, and all we know is it has to occur before the cancer shows up, but it, uh, it, you don't control, it's, it's sporadic. So, it, but it's, uh, I would say it's highly likely that it's, uh, you know, you can 98% uh, certain that it's going to occur from the translocation. And specifically, uh, either it'll be around 25% of the time it'll be PAX7 4CAD, and then the remaining 70 some odd percent will be uh, PAX3 for Ted. Other questions? Okay, don't feel shy. <laughs>
<laughs> about asking questions. Yes. Sure. Uh, right. Now, the, uh, what we study is, uh, in my own lab, what I think what's important is that the person who's doing the experiments is really uh, wed to the project. Okay, so for example, the alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma was a pediatric oncologist that worked with alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. The, uh, the synovia, uh, again, was somebody that's interested in sarcomas. So the projects I work on are dependent on who I have, and I spend many, many days initially just talking to that person and asking, you know, what, is, what interests them? Because in science, what's important is uh, that science doesn't stop when you leave the lab, okay? You have to continue to think about it, and so you want to be able to think about it and be interested in it, and if you're really into it, then you'll do a really good job. And so in my own lab, we work on many, many different things simply because of that. So I, I try to wed the project to whoever's working on it. Uh, and that's why we work on in neurophysiology, we work in development, we work in cancer, you know, we work in practically anything. And the things that we're working on now uh, that we're thinking about in our way out in science fiction land right now. <coughs> yes. Mm -hmm. right. Now, what we're doing is, uh, I mean, w with all of these models, what we're doing now is then converting them actually into cell culture models. Uh, for example, in the synovia sarcoma, one of the, th the things we found was uh, the reason they're arising near joint is because the cartilage itself is producing something that keeps those cells alive. Okay, so now we can convert this into a cell culture system and actually look for cells that will, once we add the fusion gene in it, now we can add other things to it and see what makes those cells now survive. And so once we have that, then we'll also then look at progression of that tumor. The, in the cell culture, the advantage there is that we can do a lot of experiments and we can test a lot of drugs and so on uh, very rapidly and cheaply. Uh, on the other hand, in cell culture, sometimes you can be led astray because what's happening in the body is much more complex, the interaction of many more tissues. But in this system, we can go back and forth. So we can do the ex initial experiments in cell culture. Then if we see, and what we want to know is every step. Uh, once we, you know, remember every cancer is not just one step. It's about minimally four, often six to seven different steps. But once you identify every one of those steps, some of those steps are going to be much more refractory, easy to make drugs that are specific for that step, and then, and then we can test it. So we'll use these models not only to learn about the cancer, but then as a tool, as a platform to develop therapies. So that's the, so that's the back and forth aspect of it. And so what's important and what hasn't happened in many of these sarcomas, we don't know all of those steps. So people simply uh, choose a certain regime that's worked in the past, but it doesn't work very well. And so what we have to do is understand the cancer, know each step, then develop drugs that are specific for that cancer. And what, I mean, what we can see just from these two examples, molecularly, they're completely different. There, there's no, even though both are generated by translocation, everything's different about the cancer. So every cancer is going to be different. Everyone is going to have to have a specific uh, therapy developed that's specific to it. Yes. Uh, I'm afraid uh, the, the translocations are, are going to happen uh, no matter what. I mean, uh, it would be nice to be able to inhibit that. But that, that frequency, as I pointed out, is extreme. I mean, one in a thousand cells will have a translocation occur. It, it, fortunately, many of the translocations aren't going to have a bad effect. Only some of them lead to cancer, and then some of them will lead to a myopathy. Some of them, my guess, will, be, will lead actually to neurodegenerative diseases. That's one area where I think we actually should be starting to look for translocations as causative agent. 
uh, and people have looked at cancer because that's easy because that population grows up and therefore we can see it. In the other cancers you don't have those cells amplified and therefore it's much more difficult to assess. But the, I think the mechanism for, uh, I mean, uh, translocation simply occur, I mean, it's um, amazing. Every one of your uh, cells in your body every day gets about 10,000 insults. And this occurs mostly from oxygen radicals, but it can cause from UV light and so on and so forth. So all of these things happen, and then you have machinery there that corrects these defects. But the, so I don't think it's, it's going to be very difficult to prevent the translocations. You're simply going to have to deal with it once you see a pathology. Uh, and hopefully the earlier you see it, obviously, the more likely you are to be able to do something about it. Yes? Can you tell us anything about your own personal life story? Uh -huh. <laughs> sure. Uh, it was a circuitous route. Uh, uh, I, the, I mean, I came, uh, uh, I started out in, uh, as, as most people do, uh, with your parents. And, and the, uh, my uh, particular, my mother was a poet, and she, uh, this is just at the beginning of the Second World War, and she was, uh, she felt that she, with her pen, she could smite, essentially, fascism and, and, uh, and uh, Nazism. So she did a lot of pamphleteering, but she did know that that wasn't going to be, uh, be a long haul. Uh, and therefore, she set up so that uh, uh, she was anticipating being picked up, and, and actually she was in 1941. And at, at that point, when I was about age three and a half, uh, she had given money to a small family, and then I moved in with them. Unfortunately, the money ran out and after about one year, so then I set on the road, and I started uh, migrating uh, this was way up north in Italy, and then I started migrating south. Uh, as uh, your cover becomes, uh, you know, you have to essentially you have to go out and get your own food. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, after a while, they recognize you and chase you out of that town. You move to the next town, and so on. Uh, so that uh, continued uh, from uh, age four and a half to nine. And then at the end of that period, she was interned in Germany uh, in a concentration camp. But she didn't die, and therefore she, then she set out to find me, and took about two years to find me. She did locate me, but and she had a brother in the United States, and so then I came to the United States uh, on a boat uh, that, with money that my brother or my uncle had sent uh, to for us. <clears throat> so at that point, I arrived in the uh, United States. I arrived one day, had never had any schooling or anything, uh, and the next day I went to school. Uh, and so, and then had to learn English. Uh, my, uh, my, the science connection is that my uncle is a physicist, and therefore I saw a lot about uh, science uh, at an early age, and then uh, uh, decided when I went to college, I initially uh, was in physics, and then decided I didn't like the problems that were being asked there, and uh, switched over to biophysics, and then switched over to molecular biology just at this, as it was being born and was fortunate to be uh, in Jim's lab at that time, Jim Watson's lab, uh, and did my thesis there. So that's a synopsis of uh, whatever it is, number of years. <laughs> Any other questions? And uh, again, thank you for your patience. <laughs>